in a world where Microsoft virtualization is still considered to be the underdog by some. The Hyper-V Amigos enlighten the IT crowds on how they could very well be mistaken. So, hello. Here is... Hey, hey, Didier, how are you? Hello, Preston, how are you? <laughs> this I'm is... fine. <laughs> You're fine, I'm fine too. This is the first recording of the Hyper-V Amigo, should we call it podcast or videocast or showcast? It's, let's call it a showcast and we can do whatever we want. <laughs> showcast is cool. I'm Carsten Rachfall. I'm uh, from Germany. You maybe hear it a little bit because English is not my first language. And with me is my friend Didier van Hoye. Didier, where are you sitting? I'm sitting in my home office, actually. <laughs> I'm sitting in my office, too. <laughs> yeah, so You're, You are from Belgium. Uh, Yes, I, I am from Belgium. And not from the United States, that uh, your background is maybe... No, no, that's, that's a little, that's a little uh, blanket I, I've gotten as a present uh, yeah. for my New Year's or something. Uh, it's, it, it has something to do with the fact that I've spent a lot of time in the USA uh, the last years for uh, summits, conferences, some uh, vacation time, etc., etc. Yeah. So somebody thought it would be a good idea to give me an... Stars and Stripes blankets. So. <laughs> it's nice. Yeah. I, I want one of those too. So maybe next time when we are in the US, I will buy one. So Didier, we are from different countries. You from Belgium, I'm from Germany. And uh, maybe there are some more Hyper-V Amigos joining us. And they are also from other countries. But uh, more about that later. What have we in common? We have something in common. Well, if you really press me for an answer, I would have to say it might have something to do with the fact that we both are uh, Hyper-V MVPs yes. and we love working with Hyper-V. That's right, that's right. Just so, a wild guess. <laughs> a wild guess. And this is why it's called the Hyper-V Amigos and not the Virtual Machine Amigos, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, this couldn't happen. You know, Thank, okay. thanks to Ben for changing the name. Yeah, and I have uh, this nice uh, T-shirt. I guess you have also one of those, or huh? I have one. It's it's in the laundry. Ah, uh, so it's too bad, uh, too bad. Yes, but it states what what it is. I believe in Hyper-V, and you do the same. So did oh, you? Oh, go on. Oh, absolutely! I believe in Hyper-V, and to, to prove that, uh, after this after this uh, showcast, I'm actually migrating yet another cluster to Windows 2012 or two Hyper-V. So. Yeah, and I will maybe do a screencast about uh, upgrading uh, our storage space with uh, SSDs and uh, um, doing some SSD stuff with them. So, so we are, we are busy, man. Uh, this is a weekend. So, Didier, why why want we to do this uh, thing, uh, the Hyper-V Amigo uh, uh, showcast? I, I have to learn showcast. Okay. Well, basically, I think we, we both feel the need to be able to show things to people. Uh, it, we can't drag them all to our lab. You can write only so much. Uh, print screens only indicate what's going on. It's nice to show things to people. Yeah. And I've been trying to make some videos and I've discovered that it, one, it's not easy. Two, the quality when I get it uploaded to uh, Vimeo always seems less than when I look at them yeah. my, at my desk. And since you are a master expert in recordings, I thought, hmm, let's, let's outsource all this video thing to, <laughs> to cars. <laughs> right? I mean, That's, uh, you're, you're such a nice guy. But you're right, we both show things. Uh, we love to show. I'm, I'm quite not a writer. I hate writing. I prefer showing it. And so we, uh, we, uh, we thought maybe showing is a lot of better than uh, than uh, writing, or, uh, or at least for me, I love to show things. And you have a nice demo uh, environment, uh, even at home and also at work. And I have a lot of stuff here too. Oh, so we, we should be able to come up with something. <laughs> we will, we will. I, I, I'm sure of that. But maybe first, uh, not everyone uh, who will see this, we hope, know each of us. So maybe we do a little bit of introduction of ourselves, where we come from, how long we work in IT. What do you think, I, uh, Didier? Okay, that's a good idea. Shall you start to give me an example of uh, how to do it? Should I? Okay. So I'm I'm starting, uh, not I'm starting working in IT. Uh, I got 
first contact with IT in the last millennium. Uh, it was 1981 where I saw a computer at a friend of mine. His dad has a computer. It was a TRS-80 from CompuCheck. I, I don't know if, if you ever heard about that machine, Didier. You, you don't? don't I, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, no. It was a... It was a nice thing. You have only ASCII and there were games on that. So I started as gamer and uh, very, very, very fast. I want to have a computer on my own. And I was, okay. I was 14 uh, uh, then. Uh, so it is, can I say that? It's 33 years ago now. We have t uh, t uh, 2014. It was uh, 1981. And I saved a lot of money by working in, uh, as holiday jobs in fabrics and so on to buy my first computer. And it was not the fabulous uh, CompuShack TRS-80. It was a Genius One. It was a, a cheaper version of this computer. And I started playing, of course. I think I started my career as gamer, but, okay. but I got bored very uh, very soon about these games and I tried to do things of my own program and so on. And then I bought an Apple, an Apple IIe. We had that in school and uh, I started to program with USC Pascal. I don't know if you heard of that. Well, I, Pascal I know, Yeah. but USC Pascal, I don't know that it particular... Was, it was on the Apple, you, ha you had to have two floppies and uh, one is one you were booting your system from, and, and the other you can save data. Those were still the, the five and a half inch. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Th these were, those were really floppy. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. This yeah. was this. And you can uh, make holes in them to use both sides, you remember? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I, I, I remember drilling holes in the, the three and a half inch uh, floppies. Really? Stuff, like, <laughs> stuff like that. Yes, yes, yes. So, and um, I, I've done a lot of things with the Apple. I bought another uh, another card. You can, uh, with the Apple, you can add cards into it, like the, the PCs we have nowadays. And I bought an, an Z80 processor card where you can, could do CPM on it. So I had two operating systems in one box. You can start the Apple operating system with a Motorola 6502 processor, the good old one, uh, but it had only four registers, I think, and for programming, it was really hard to deal with four registers. And the Z80 from, I think, Intel, the Intel Z80 processor, this has much more registers and so I started programming in assembler, but this is quite hard to program wow. in assembler. Assembler? Yes. I'm impressed. I'm actually yeah, impressed. Yes, I, I started as a programmer, even my uh, business career. So I will talk about that. Then after that, I got an uh, Atari ST1024 with my first hard disk. It was such, such a thing with a 30 megabyte hard disk and it was very, very loud. And <laughs> I played with, um, with the Atari. Even my wife had to buy another Atari for herself. So uh, she was not into computers then as deep as I was. I was a computer nerd from the start and I always want to do some things in computer. So I, I've done my school career. I, I, I've got my Abitur in Germany. I don't know how the English word is. Uh, the, the, the higher education where you are allowed to study with in Germany, there are different education. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. You need uh, to do an exam to be allowed to go to higher education. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, but when I was in the, the 13th grade, uh, um, I started to work for a company in IT as a programmer and they had a modular compiler. Modular is the next programming language from uh, Nicolas Wirth who invented Pascal. Maybe you know that. And uh, I started working in a company who was doing a modular compiler for different Unix systems and also for a, a real-time operating system like OS9. And uh, we were programming modules for that. And there I start as a programmer on Unix, not Linux, Unix. And I remember I was working with a colleague of mine on a, we two, two of us were working on an HP UX machine with four megabytes of RAM. And we both are compiling and working on this machine. So if you look at the systems now, I'm sitting in front of a 32 gigabyte notebook 
my data center in a box and we, we, we had so less memory and uh, it was cool. So after that I, um, uh, I, I worked for another company in parallel I was studying, um, it's in Germany it's called Nachrichtentechnik. It has to do something with signaling, uh, an engineering thing, but I okay. pretty, I got bored of that quite fast and I, I thought I can do without an, a, a degree from the u university. I, I was already working and if you work in computer, you maybe forgot to study and uh, that was the case with me. <laughs> so I worked and worked and um, after three years uh, working as in a company, uh, the company um, wasn't doing so well so they closed the doors. So and what did you do <laughs> to the company, man? I mean, <laughs> with a with a friend of mine, uh, it was in 1991. Uh, um, we decided to start our own company, and uh, I started the Rachfall Datentechnik then in 1991. This is 22, 23 years actually ago, and from then on, on I'm self-employed, and my friend worked as an employee. And I went with my wife to Stuttgart. Um, she worked. She has finished her study. Um, she's something like um, controller uh, in finance, finance controller. Okay. She knows about money. Uh, about money, exactly. And she, were, uh, she was searching for a job. And I thought, okay, she is working. She will earn the money. Maybe it's time that you go study again. And uh, I study uh, something like automation. Uh, I'm an engineer in automation. It's uh, like when you have robots and uh, SPS things. And I, I got this degree because you, you could do a lot of things with computer there, but it was not a, a studying of mathematic because okay. in, in, the, in these days, the informatics, there was a, a, stu um, a, a study called informatic and it was all the things of mathematics yes except one exam and i, I don't i didn't like um, uh, mathematics so much that i want to do that it was the same in belgium it used to be uh, i think uh, a little subdivision of the mathematical yeah, department yeah. yeah so and i studied uh, automation and there we do a lot of things with robots with uh, pascal with c c++ also a, a lot of programming things and there I got contact with more Unix systems. I was um, not tutor. If you work in uh, for for professors, yeah. um, to to do assistant? Their assistant, assistant, yes, to to uh, assist them in their labs, and uh, I was uh, caring about the computers they had. And there, actually, I I um, I got c in contact with the internet. There was the internet uh, in, oh, in yes. these days, uh, but there was no web. So you had to do something with Telnet, FTP, and there was this thing with Gopher. Do you remember Gopher? Yes, I do. With hyperlinks and, and, and all was text and so on. And Pine for email. <laughs> yes, Pine. On, uh, even on Novell, where you had uh, Pine. I think, it, was it Pine and Mercury? Do you remember that? There was. I only, I, we only had Pine. Okay. And then um, I was working in, uh, for one of the professors. He had a graphics laboratory where he was doing a lot of things with graphics and then the web was born in uh, 1993 and we compiled the first browsers on these Unix machines and started to to do things with uh, HTTP uh, so that was really great and I was there on a university when when the web was born and uh, I was doing it from the first time yeah? and after I finished my study in 1995 my company was run, running in parallel we are, we were doing a lot of things with MS-DOS with Windows 3.1 with uh, Novell Network at companies, um, I uh, decided with my wife to go back to uh, the Sauerland where we are uh, sitting um, or where our company is placed because of our, uh, our parents, both of them are uh, my parents and the parents of my wife are from or are living in the Sauerland uh, and so we got back here and started a new company that's called the Rachfall and Tilke O OHG from 1995 and uh, we were doing uh, consulting at uh, local companies 
and uh, also uh, doing an, uh, working as an internet provider in the region. There was no internet provider, and so we started to offer internet services, dial-in modems where you can access the internet. And uh, yeah. this worked quite well until the, the mid-2000, the mid 2000, 2006. Uh, in, and in 2006, we decided to split up the company in an internet part and uh, um, consulting part. And my wife and I own the consulting part, and our partner, Michael Thielke, uh, own now the Nets Pepper in, um, in, in Winterberg, that's near of Hallenberg, and he is doing a lot of internet stuff. And from this day on, uh, I, we were only doing consulting. We are doing a lot of consulting in the small business area. But then I got, I saw Hyper-V. I started before Hyper-V with Virtual Server, maybe as you di uh, did. And I thought Hyper-V is great. And I'm, I'm a Hyper-V guy from the first hour. So yep. now I'm doing a lot of consulting in Hyper-V and um, I'm, I'm doing only Hyper-V and storage. And of course, a little bit of System Center. So I'm, I got, after this Unix phase, I got into PCs. Uh, I bought my own PCs, and till then I'm a PC guy. I played with Linux, of course, but uh, I love Windows and I love the Microsoft virtualization. So maybe this is enough about me, uh, so that you are not bored. I want to hear your story now. <laughs> well, I only have to say that you're quite a nerd, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> no, no, no. So I started a bit later than you did. Uh, uh, we didn't have money for a computer at home, so when all the cool kids were getting the Commodores and stuff like that, that was something that was not a world for me. But yeah. when I went to university, uh, I decided, well, this this thing is important. I need to get on board. So I I spent my uh, my cash I earned with a student job in the summertime on a computer, and that yeah. was a 386 with uh, 100 megabyte disks and 4 megabytes of RAM. Oh, nice. Yes, yes, and it ran Windows <laughs> 3, 1 or something like that. And I was, well, I was a bit uh, enchanted. I, I found it all very interesting and I wanted to learn more. But at the time I was a, a student in biology and uh, all of a sudden, we got all these new toys in the lab later on in the studies that started producing lots of data. Okay. And that was the first real confrontation with, oh my God, we're never going to be able to, to calculate all this stuff by hand or how, how are we going to deal with this? So then my colleague started with the first uh, uh, macros in Excel to start calculating the data that came from the, the automated uh, scientific machines. And that's how I got interested in programming. And then after, after graduating, I was an assistant for a while and I decided that the academic world was perhaps nothing for me. So I, I needed to do something else. So I started working in data and statistics. Okay. And uh, the fun part about that one, of course, was like, my God, there's way too much data. How do we deal with this? So there comes that little computer again. So that's how I started. And I became uh, actually quite an expert in VBA and Visual Basic and programming stuff to deal with data. Okay. And then I got into uh, OLAP tools. Today they would call it business intelligence, but online analytical processing, all the cool stuff to get information out of the data. That was quite interesting. That was all in the, in the late 90s. And then I was working so, so much with computers that I wanted to do more and more. And I also got more and more interested in all the, the lower level parts because, you know, you're doing programming and you're, you're doing business intelligence or whatever. And then it's like the network guys always seemed like the real gurus that knew what was going on okay. with all those packets on okay. the wire. <laughs> uh, and another thing that annoyed me at that moment is that uh, all the real cool stuff they kept away from you. At least that's how I saw it. You know, the, the Unix servers, the storage, what's going on over there? I want to learn, but they were very protective of it. So that's when I, I, I left and I, uh, I went to, to go and work where I could, could play with the, with the cool machines. And then it was like, whoa, I've got a lot to learn. And yes, I've started learning and I have never stopped since, basically. Yeah. Uh, but, I, but I transitioned from programming to, uh, to infrastructure more because at a, at a given moment as a, as a developer, I was sick and tired of the lousy infrastructure we had. Okay. 
because there was this there was this uh, understanding or acknowledgement of the fact that you need really good infrastructure to deploy your application and, and make it work well and fast and perform well, blah, blah, blah. So I thought like, look, I'm going to stop programming for a while now and I'm going to fix all this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and basically, <laughs> I'm still fixing stuff. So, uh, yeah. And then? And then you started uh, to work for a big, uh, big company in Belgium, or a big. Uh, no, it's uh, not. It's not a big company. I, but you have a lot of data. You yeah, a big it's data yes, company. Uh, well, big data is perhaps something else. They have lots of data, yeah, and lots. it can be big data. It can be big data, but the cool stuff is uh, the environment where I work is work in is with geographical information. Uh, systems. So that means that they have satellite imagery, they have aerial photography, they've got these maps, vector data, they've got scan data, mm -hmm. they've got all kinds of data and especially lots of it. And these people are, let's say, they, they don't like to be limited. So they needed lots of bandwidth, lots of storage and speed. And they became accustomed to being able to throw around lots of data. So the challenge was how to do this without breaking the bank, without paying too much money to, to, to uh, achieve all that. And we, we've always been rather creative in spending money in the right place, saving some money somewhere else. And what we learned from that is that you really didn't need the high-end, really expensive hardware, really expensive software. If you, if you take the commodity hardware and think a bit outside of the box, you can do a lot. And the money you save, you spend where you really need it, right? Yeah. Uh, and after a while, you know, virtualization became became more and more something that came on, on the forefront of things that were happening. And I actually started dabbling with uh, VMware Workstation. That was my first virtualization product. I got a copy for free, I think, at my very first TechNet ever in 2001. So this is your excuse, huh? You got a copy for uh, free. <laughs> yes, I got a copy for free. And that was nice. Uh, and then uh, I started playing with uh, VMware Server, which was also free, and Virtual Server, that was also free. And then oh, we like the free model. The new... We like the free. We like the free model. Like Hyper-V is also free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We like it. <laughs> For some reason, my boss likes it as well. Uh, okay. So, but we we actually quite liked uh, virtual. Uh, uh, no, sorry, VMware Server because that could deal with 64-bit guest operating systems, and yeah. virtual virtual server couldn't. And in our line of business, we went to 64 bits the moment we could on the Windows platform. Of course, of the, I mean, that was very important for us. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that was a bit of the, of the reason why we were doing a lot of uh, uh, VMware server. But then they came out with a new version and we, we, we were like, oh my God, they ruined the product. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we also decided that we needed to do something a bit more on a, on a professional and a larger scale. And then we had the option to go to VMware, uh, ESX. But around that time frame, we were doing uh, Hyper-V in the beta, the early, the early beta. Okay. And we were like, hey, wait a minute. This basically will not cost us a thing. And if it's good enough, it's good enough. So we took a gamble. And we said to the boss, look, we're going to do Hyper-V. And uh, the biggest thing we're missing was the, the, the V-Motion, the live migration. Okay. But, uh, but uh, we, we were like, okay, this is not going to stay this way. Microsoft will fix this and they will, you know, improve the product. They, yeah. they're, in, they're, in, they're in it for real. So we were early adopters of uh, Hyper-V. And I remember reading the blogs uh, of John Howard and Jose Barreto at the time when they were explaining the, the virtual switch and storage. And, and I was really reading everything I could find. Yeah. I, I called it the free university on Hyper-V because that was it. There was nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> but by doing that, we learned a lot. And I also found that you could, well, mail them and post comments on their blogs. And yes, they did answer. So we got more and more involved with, with Hyper-V. We, we went to R2 very quickly. We went to 2012 very quickly. And now we are, well, replacing in, in everything. The, we, we... In the transition to 2012 R2. Yes, that's in full swing. Yeah. And it's also quickly because the product has uh, come to life or uh, came to life in uh, October 2013, I guess. Yeah. 
yeah, so yeah. we have now February 2014. This is only yeah. five months ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, very soon we will not have any 2012 left. It will be all be R2. Yeah, so you think the product is is uh, good enough to go in production with? Oh, absolutely. It's 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 actually it's it's, it's actually quite an excellent product. Yeah. If you if but you have to know what you're doing, and that goes for any technology. If you just take take something like a SQL Server or an Exchange, and you click next 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 during the installation, um. It might run for a while if you're lucky, and then very quickly things will fall apart. I mean, perhaps one of the of the most uh, problematic issues in IT today is that everybody seems to think it has become very cheap. It can do just about anything, and it's so easy your mother can do it. Yeah, yeah. And in reality, that isn't true. You. And I see a lot of ish of things go wrong because of that re of those yeah, reasons. Yeah, yeah, that's especially true. What you are saying with uh, Hyper-V in contrast to uh, VMware, because VMware is a product. It has no graphical GUI. You have something on a server. You have a login screen, but you can't do a lot of things on the on the command line. I guess in Windows or with Hyper-V, it's only some GUI things to click on next, 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 finish. And people are thinking they have a product that, that is running not good enough. It's running great. And uh, that's not true. You have to think a lot of about your design. You have to get some uh, resiliency in the product. So if maybe a network card fails, not your whole system is uh, standing and uh, I think it's a, this is a little bit of a of a flaw that it is too, so easy to install Hyper-V. I, I don't know if it's a flaw because I mean th that same remark in my career you have heard about Exchange, about SQL Server, yeah. about about Visual Basic, you know Microsoft, Microsoft's big big uh, contribution to the IT world was is that they dem uh, they, they, they opened up IT to yep. a lot of people where it used to be confined to the big companies with the big budgets because otherwise you could never afford those machines. And on the other hand, in, in, in let's say the Unix world, well, that uh, opening up was Linux's uh, uh, virtue, you know, P because people were fed up there as well. How, how do you do Linux? You go buy an IBM box, you go buy an HP uh, box. Uh, no, people wanted to do uh, stuff uh, cheaper and yeah. more, or more affordable as yeah, well. Yeah. So the world opened up, and I think that's that's one of the big credits you have to give Microsoft. They yeah. really they really got a lot of companies uh, to a level of inf of uh, uh, information technology that that would have been impossible before. Yeah. Uh, and of course, with with opening it up to lots of people, it has a drawback. Yeah, yeah. Flaw was not the right word I, I choose. It's not a fault of Microsoft that it is too so easy or that they have a graphical GUI to do that. It's uh, it's in the mind of the people because I think Windows, they oh, it's Windows, I can click on something and it works. And when you are doing virtualization, especially in the level we are doing it in companies, uh, where you have to have resiliency, where you have to have clusters, and it has to run, o run all the time. It's not so so easy or it's not a click through you have to think on your network design you have to think on your storage design you have to think on your backup strategy and so on and uh, um, what I want to say is if you are on a, on a hypervisor maybe Xen server or uh, VMware um, there is not this easy click through thing and everything is working at, at least as I know maybe it, it has changed but uh, um, so the people there say uh, when they are new to it I have to go to uh, to education I, I I need education to run this thing right and if it's in Windows the people think oh I don't need education it is Windows uh, I can I have some GUIs I have some setup routines and everything is working well and Sometimes it isn't, of course, because you have to do it right. Like in every other uh, virtualization uh, environment, you have to do it the right way. And you are blogging a lot of, about it uh, and your experience, and I do the same. To educate people how to do it right or uh, choose one way that is better than another. 
You know, you can... Well, you, you have to get people to think about what they're doing. That's the most important thing. Yeah. It's, it's not just a one size fits all, the magic one sheet, uh, ah, your, your bullet th- points. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that doesn't that doesn't yeah, exist. Yeah, yeah. But but it's also true that a lot of people have been doing uh, VMware a lot longer than they have been doing Hyper V. So there is a bit of a learning curve because of, of it's not just it's not just uh, the same product with a different name. It's it, they have different ways of doing things or of achieving things. That's right. And, I got a lot of questions. I do that in uh, VMware this way, and they want to do it the same way in Hyper V. Yeah. And as you said, there are there are different ways in Hyper-V than in VMware. It's not a, a a copy thing of VMware. Everything was in VMware is now in Microsoft, and they they got it and copied it to to Microsoft. It's it have some there are some different um, approaches to things, and you have to learn them in a, in Hyper-V. And it's the same for VMware. If you are doing Hyper-V all the time and want to do a VMware, it's not the same. You have to adapt to the product and do some things differently. Yeah? Yeah. I, I didn't say this, this is good and this is bad, but it's different. Yeah? And yeah. You, c- you can't uh, take your sheet, your blueprint of an Hyper-V environment and push it onto a VMware environment. And everything or vice versa. Or yeah. vice versa, of course. Yeah. 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 And uh, in the moment, there are a lot of vice versa. So there are a lot of people coming from VMware and want to do Hyper-V because maybe of the market share VMware has and the price and a lot of people learn maybe Hyper-V is not good enough. It's a good product and uh, it, can, it, it can compare with VMware. Oh, it's, it's a very good product. That's, that's, that's not the problem. Right? But I think the problem is more wide than just, than just Hyper-V. I mean, IT has grown enormously over the past decade. That means a lot of people have gotten into IT, there's a lot of need for IT, and talent is hard to scale. So, you know, if, if you need a thousand uh, highly skilled people, it's going to be more difficult to get a thousand that are up to par than if you only need 10. Of course. And, perha- and perhaps that's also a bit of the reason. I see a lot of consulting going on that, I, 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 I mean, that, that, that word consultant it has become a bit uh well you know it has it has a very it's 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 suffering from inflation a consultant used to be somebody who was highly expert high uh, had a high expertise in his subject matter and nowadays i mean you come straight out of high school uh, you work a couple of years and you are a senior consultant yeah and if you if you just take away the the default gateway on one of those people's servers, they are you know lost forever. <laughs> it's it's like you know, I always compare it to 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 the medical sector. I mean, I I I, I accept that a brain surgeon doesn't know everything about uh, the lung functions like a, like a, a lung disease expert would. Yeah. But I, I get a I get a bit worried if my brain surgeon would say blood pressure what 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 what's that thingy you know i'm i'm like I, perhaps you need to become a doctor first yeah. before you become a specialist yeah. in something and i see a lot of specialists who who don't have that yeah. broad uh, knowledge of their uh, field and sometimes it worries me yeah sometimes it really worries me now the good thing is of course that people like you can make uh, a decent living out of being the real expert and <laughs> <laughs> even know a little bit of the other stuff because yeah. here's uh, how you call it if you get back to the point at the beginning we were talking about our experience in IT and I I'm profiting every day from the things I have done in the past I saw a lot of things we were even uh, internet provider I told you and I had yeah. to do a lot of TCP uh, mail exchange uh, DNS servers uh, even a little bit BGP I, I, I'm not an expert in BGP uh, but, but I have two BGP uh, uh, anon, anon, how you call it Aut- autonomous systems uh, here in in my little company running and uh, so I uh, that's an advantage maybe um, you have to have some experience in IT so you have yeah. to be a little bit older than 20 to got to get this experience to help people uh, in other in other areas and uh, what what's missing today is the guy who is the architect who knows everything a bit or even yeah. a bit more yeah, but to but that, to, that, conce- that. to how you how you call it yeah. to 
to, 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 to tie it all together. Yeah, so, of the, course. Yeah. There but are so the, many specialists, uh, specialist A, specialist B, and there's nothing between them. Every, everybody is doing his job right yeah. and good. But how but, you but get they're the si they're silos. You know? They're silos. Yeah. How to get that's them together? That's one of the things we believe in. We we actually try to own the entire stack. So yeah. all all the stories we, we we hear so many many times about. Oh, I have to get the storage guy to do this, and the network guys have to do that, yeah. and the, the the system guys need this, so the virtualization guy can do that. And I'm like, I don't want that. I always try to make sure we own the entire stack from the storage, the networking, the servers, the virtualization layer. We own it. And it's not like I need to get approval from the from the storage team. Like we are the storage team. Yeah, oh, right. I need to get. Yeah. And that's that's something that gives you two things. It gives you control and responsibility. You control what you are responsible for, and you are of course responsible for what you control. But you also get to show and train people in all the layers of the stack. So you don't have a Hyper-V guy that doesn't get TCP IP or, or doesn't get what storage mm. uh, can do and cannot do. So you get better context and that context is very important. Because one of the things is experience is one thing, context is another, people who think, people who, who, who have yeah. that architect role. But it's, it's not just age. Of course, you, you, you can, Unless you're an absolute genius, you cannot be an architect at age 20. But I know a lot of people who are 50, who've spent 30 years in IT, and who still seem... And I know ar architect. Yeah, and, and who still... <laughs> and, and are not experts who, either. Yeah, it's, it's like... <laughs> hmm. so, yeah, but you have to have passion yeah. for IT. Uh, you have to have a passion for it. It's not yeah. something... I always say that to my boss. Uh, yeah. uh, I... I I don't know what you think I do. I, I don't put some kind of a book under my pillow at night and in the morning I know all the stuff. Yeah. We actually but, but spend that would be nice, wouldn't yeah. it? Yes, it would be nice. And if, if that was possible, everybody would be doing it. So, yeah. I mean, but it, but it is true. It, 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 it isn't, it, you, need, you need that, that architectural, but even that terminology has become uh, a, a victim of inflation. Because yeah. recently I, there, was, there was complaints in the, in the Belgian media about that they couldn't find an architect and if you looked at what they were willing to pay and what they needed an architect for it was like come on people you, you're looking for a, a, a junior uh, most, most jack of all trades uh, system admin to run the company mm -hmm. but you are not looking for an architect but if you if you if you advertise for an IT architect who has to install the printer toners whilst uh, patching the cables, rolling out the PCs, and designing your, your SQL Server environment, you might be like, hmm, you're looking for a jack of all trades, and you're willing to pay uh, entry-level wages. And then none of the architects you have in mind or know are enthusiastic about that job. Yeah. And then you start complaining that, oh, we can't find the people we need. And it's like, be realistic in what yeah. you need. Mm -hmm. Uh, people tend to over, over I think, estimate uh, the kind of people they need. Yeah, I right. mean, it's like get an architect, and he can do everything. It's not. But, it's not true. An architect is a is a guy who has, or a girl, of course, who has uh, the overview of everything. And uh, in my understanding, uh, ask the people who have deep knowledge in maybe this silo and uh, bring him bring them together with the people in this silo because. You, you said it, IT got important the last 10 years, more and more important in every kind of company. And everything we are doing is uh, connected with IT. And look at our private lives, internet, with the phone, with the shopping, with everything. Is uh, Internet is a kind of communication and is, you need IT for that. So we need IT everywhere. And as you, as you say, we can't produce the, new, the knowledge uh, out of school. Everyone knows everything in IT. Uh, you have to get into it to, to learn a lot. And uh, then you, get, you, you will be maybe a specialist in some area. And it would be nice if you have a, a broad overview of uh, some areas. You, yeah. can't, you can't have them in all. That's not possible. Uh, that's, that's, that, that's normal. That's for every industry. For yeah. every, for, yeah. uh, but, but the thing is, I mean, look, look, look at the cloud. Look at commoditization. That, that's that's great because what does it mean? You get the stuff that's a commodity for a very nice price, easy. Uh, it is what it is. I mean, it's like 
you can you can say oh I like uh, OneDrive or I like Dropbox and both have benefits and drawbacks but you don't complain about the fact or you don't start customizing it because it doesn't do what you want it's free or it's very cheap and you use it for what it is yeah. and then you spend your time and money and also your talent in the things that are high value and need expertise and customization because one of the one of the mistakes I see made a lot in IT is that people take commodities and treat them like they are something special and they are not so they waste a lot of time and effort over there and then they don't have the money or the time or the other experts to work on the really important stuff okay so I think that's the maturing of the industry and that's still going on and I think the cloud might be might be helping there a lot because it's it's very funny when I when I look now in the cloud people still accept limits and when it's on premise or in house, they don't. IT has to do magic. Yeah. And and in the cloud, it's like you buy something or you get something for free, whatever it is, and that it does what it does, and everybody seems to accept it. And when you say in house or on premise, well, this we won't do because one, it's not a good idea. It's too complex. It's too expensive. It's like no, 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 no. You have to make this work. It's like, but this is economical madness to do that. <laughs> and in the cloud, you, you don't seem to have those discussions. Yeah. So, but uh, I want to come back to our uh, initial uh, thoughts. Uh, we told about us ourselves. Of course, you're right with the cloud. I know that. And we want to educate people a little bit more about Hyper-V and Hyper-V related things. This is the purpose of our video no, not uh, showcast. We, we call showcast. it showcast. Yeah. Showcast. So did you. Um, I hope people got an impression about both of us. Uh, we talked a little bit. We shared a little bit or a lot of our thoughts of our, um, how you call it, the things that uh, we are confronted with in, in our work uh, and with people. And so you, the people know us a little bit. And in the next uh, session, we want to do real stuff showing stuff how we will do with that well we're, we're gonna try to to take people on a journey through some scenarios and demonstrations in a lab it's it's always nice uh, when you read something about uh, let's say virtual rss or vmq or uh, nick teaming but to be able to show people yeah. how it works what it does what the results are what the behavior is when you change things or con configure things is is a lot more impressive uh, to a lot of people because it becomes more more hands-on more more uh, yeah you can you can almost touch and feel it see what it does instead of reading about it yeah. and that's something that I found myself uh, for myself anyway I like to read I like to study but I only gain real understanding and knowledge by doing okay you know you have to play with a product because wh when you're reading you're making assumptions you might be understanding things not the way that they are you might have some uh, wrong ideas about certain technologies and when you start really implementing it playing with it that's why i play a lot i call it playing but it's experimenting name it whatever you want if it's my boss who's asking i'm of course doing uh, very high level testing if, if 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 i'm talking to my colleagues i'm playing with this stuff to f to figure out to figure out what's happening but basically that's it and 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 that playing that that the homo ludens you know the the human being that plays learns a lot yeah and and videos for people who who don't have access to certain uh hardware can help out there a lot i think so okay. that's right let's try that okay we will do that and uh, i think we will come back uh, the next two or four weeks uh, Didi and I, we have to find a date for that and then we will start maybe with some cool stuff we you saw in your environment. What do you think? Okay, we can try that. Yeah, we'll do that. that. Yeah, we'll do that. So I think okay. we're, this, I think we, we say this is a, is a day. Uh, we uh, talked about us a lot and in the next time, uh, next show, we will show things. And perhaps uh, it would be interesting to get some of our fellow experts or uh, MVPs on board to share even more information. Uh, we will do that, uh, of course. I, so I all, know all our, I... all our, 
all our friend MVPs who are now hiding under the table <laughs> because they know we are talking about them. <laughs> yes, yes, we want you at, on board. At least, <laughs> at least the two other Hyper-V Amigos. And maybe yes. in the next show we will, uh, we will a little bit talk about the Hyper-V Amigo thing, why we came on to, to that uh, name. There is a little bit history about that. It's, uh, I think, two years ago, but we will not talk about that now. We will uh, save that for the next session. Huh? Okay, fair okay. enough. So, I would say bye from Germany and uh, maybe Didier. Okay, goodbye from Belgium. So, See now you. I'm going to yeah? put my money where my bound is. I'm going to migrate <laughs> yet another cluster to 2012 <laughs> or two. And I will play a little bit with storage spaces. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>